Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. You might have uh, seen my previous video where I upgraded my Atoll MP for a LAN party we're hosting here in Sweden. So it's in Halmstad on the 5th of August. You can check it out, I'm gonna have a Facebook link at the bottom. So if you want to show up either with the system or uh, just check out what we're doing, you're welcome. So on that note, uh, we have had a lot of interest and uh, some people they can't either can't get a computer in time or they don't want to build one or whatever so they've been asking like do we have anything to lend out and uh, I have two systems one for me and one for a friend so I'm out but I've been planning a build so I've been sorting parts so this card was donated to me by a discord friend in Germany uh, it's Ferris, it's called there. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but yeah. So I've been looking for a U44 card to build, like initially it was intended to be an Atlant Thunderbird 1400 build, uh, because that's what bottom like by my U43 TI200 that overclocked like nothing. So also, that was the original intent, but then it kind of bled into a very early Atlant mobile, but that had problems with one of the boards I wanted to use. It worked fine on another board. That board I want for something else. So in the end, what we're gonna do is like a mid 2002 uh, U44 slash Atom XP build. So this uh, U44 card is a TI4200, 128 megabytes. This is made by MSI, but this is a rebrand. It's like an uh, OEM version, medium I think. So you have an undercore, underclock core of 225 megahertz, which should be 250 from factory from NVIDIA if it was reference. The memory is clocked at 444, which is original for the tier of card, but the memory is 500 megahertz rated. One of these cards should outperform a GeForce 3 TI500, at least the 64 meg version, because that has fast RAM at 500 stock. So. And what I've seen, that's like 15-20% over the u 3 TI500. So with this, at this spare stock clock, I would say probably just a hair faster, but since it overclocks quite well, it should uh, run a circle around the GeForce 3 TI500. Uh, this card also had a broken fan, but uh, it's silent, spins very easily now. Uh, it was not a serviceable fan, but the rear was, if you took it out, uh, the, it was open at the back. And uh, there was no C-clip or anything, it was just a domed axle, I don't know how to put it together. And there was a bit of foam, and I think something underneath that was supposed to be compressed and push up on the fan. So Because it kept crashing down on the hub and you're scratching on it. So I put a uh, put new lube in and uh, a nylon washer between, basically, between the foam that is pushing on the fan from behind and the axle. So it acts like a needle bearing, that's why so run so easily and quietly now. So this is uh, like one of the stars in the show. I do have another star, being, let's call it that, that I collected a piece. So it's, uh, yeah, the pieces are coming together for this build. I've been planning it before the LAN, but uh, we need it now and all the parts are here. So figure I made a video of the build. For motherboard, we're gonna be using this. This is an ASRock board. So it's kind of a budget board, but I actually tested some uh, Asus budget board, same chipset, everything basically, and uh, that board had like three major bags with CPU support, with the uh, controller card support. So like if you want to like run, you could probably get away with SCSI, maybe an old card, but like say a SATA card, nope. It had uh, horrible uh, support for networking, kind of weird bug, mostly BIOS I think. So the onboard stopped working at random, same thing with an add-on card of any make and model. So I got kind of tired with my Asus version of this and uh, ended up testing this one instead because I had have made a build on this before and the reason it's not in that build is because I got another board like this but with an m 2 chip and that is gonna be for a crew member, one of the computers I bring. So this is the old board from that system so I know it works well, I retested it, it still works well. It's uh, one of my very early boards, I recap, not the first one, but I did like in modern times to uh, speak. So it's probably four or five years ago I recapped this. I didn't have like the YouTube channel, obviously, I didn't have uh, 
any equipment at all, so I borrowed some. So, yeah, the, the, the soldering isn't great, I'll just put it that way. But uh, other than having e boring and soldering station and not having the best tips and best uh, solder and everything, or skills or knowledge, uh, uh, it works fine. The soldering looks kind of crap, but it's fine. It's uh, mostly aesthetic at this point. The, some low ESR caps here for the CPU. Yeah, and the back plate was uh, missing. So this went into a black case, actually painted black. Uh, so I made it black back then. I usually make my own IO plate. And it has a game port, which is nice because a lot of the sound cards from Creative Late Ones don't have one. So that's kind of nice. It got built in network card. Uh, they mostly do the KT400 boards because it's somehow, I think, directly connected to Southbridge via some much simplified network controller. So you install like via drivers for the network card called uh, via Rhine 2, if I recall. Uh, like I said, I think I said I had an Asus board was completely bugged. Uh, this one has no network issues and uh, stays up. So we got some USB port 2.0. The PS2 ports, uh, obviously sound and some serial parallel. But yeah, so this is like 8x AGP. We got five PCI slots. We got of unofficial, official, unofficial uh, DDR4 support. If, if I recall, the Via KT400 was released before PC3200, so DDR400. So the, the name comes from the unofficial kind of support for DDR. 400, but the board actually is 303 bus officially. Uh, doesn't have proper dividers, I think. And you can only run 400 megat RAM if you run 266 bus. If you run 333, it needs to run one to one, if I recall. Unsure, but uh, yeah, the Asus board was completely wonky on that. Uh, it doesn't matter. I usually run one to one because you get the lowest latency into memory if you run one to one. So whatever your CPU bus is, you run your memory too. So this is the board we're gonna use because it works very well with uh, one of these. It's a SIL 3114 controller card. If you put this in, connect the hard drive. That hard drive will show up in the BIOS, so you can put it in the boot menu in whatever order you want. So this gives us SATA support. Some of these boards did have SATA. My, uh, my Asus could have had it, but there wasn't added. The extra chip wasn't added to it. So this allows me to use a modern like 500 GB uh, 7200 RPM SATA drive. So that's about 80 megabytes per second in practice with those drives. So kind of convenient because in worst case you can go to a local computer store and buy a new SSD or something if the thing breaks down. And uh, for RAM, this was in the board. I got it from a friend, so I used this before, but this is basically PC3200 from Yale. Uh, way too fast for this system really, but uh, I really don't have much else than 400 DDR. I have like one stick, I think it's rated lower if we're not counting server RAM. Uh, yeah, this board was also faster than the Asus when I tested. Not much, but a little bit faster. So that's a nice bonus. So yeah, that's the RAM. And uh, for CPU, which was... Uh, like I, I I looked at a bunch of CPUs. My original intent for E44 was to actually just have like an upgraded Thunderbird 1400 with overclocking, but uh, yeah, ended up settling for this because the E44 T8 4200 in reviews that I checked uh, used uh, a lot of time used uh, an Atlas XP 2100 plus, so I knew I had a 2000 plus that was actually a shrunk one. So I think this is thoroughbred cores, 130 nanometers, 1.6 volts. The original ones are Palomino cores, 1.75 volts. So they're quite a lot more power hungry. And while looking around for that, I did find it, but I also find one just like it, basically looked the same, but it said 2200 on it. So this is a 1.8 gigahertz chip. The other one was a 1.67. And I did also find a 2100, but that was a Palomino, so that's like 68 watts versus, I think this is 60 on paper, no. Yeah, something. Now, I think there's 73 watts for the Palomino version of the 2100, and this is 60 watts for the 2200 plus version of the Turbred, the die shrunk one. So the Palomino would have a more square but bigger die. So I figured, why not use this one? It's gonna 
make the power supply choice a lot easier. You don't need like a third amp power supply. So, and uh, it's uh, slightly, ever so slightly faster than um, what they used. So it's a good stand-in. It's uh, I think this was made late 2003. The 2000 plus I had was made in 2004. So I heard about people finding 2005 Athlon XPs made in that year. They were made a long time ago. They were made, made long after the, well, the Athlon 64 was introduced. So, so th this is kind of period correct. But it's made later with a die shrunk, so good on the modern power supply. So you can put that in here in the socket. For cooling is my second star of the show because I've been looking for one of these. So these are SwiftTech uh, MC462. There are a couple of different revisions of these, but basically what you get is one big solid copper base with some milled holes, and you got uh, you got these aluminium rods, and you can maybe not see here, but I can see it's a very small uh, like circle around here with some solder, so they are kind of soldered in somehow. So this is what you uh, would ideally want. This is the Alpha Pal 8, 8045. So this is a monstrosity of a cooler. It originally came with an 80mm fan. Uh, I just bought the heatsink with some mounting kit missing, so it was quite cheap. Uh, I did have a big massive 80mm fan. The original one would be 32mm thick. This is 38, so that's why I have these studs on here, motherboard studs. Because the screws went long enough. But this is pretty much closed, and I think some revision actually had like a Delta 80. And definitely something people put on them. And some of the mounting kits was missing, so the backside nylon screws were missing, so I made some uh, from uh, motherboard studs here, some paper washers, so um, you don't scratch the board. The nylon washer and the spacer for the motherboard side was still included. The springs were included but heavily rusted, so and the, the whole heatsink was basically green and yeah, corroded. So I put it in a vinegar bath and polished it up later. So the springs have been refurbished and some uh, hobby paint, oil based, it's quite flexible so it won't ship. So yeah, and uh, then like I said, the, the spaces for the springs were missing, but they just, they just use stainless, oh, well, they're not stainless, but they use steel washers. So you get the right compression for the spring when you tighten it down. So it's kind of complete now, not all original, but uh, yeah, the big thing is the heat sink you want. And it was a lot cheaper than buying a complete one on eBay whenever they show up. I think they go for like $65 when they show up, I've seen. I paid about 20 for the heatsink with half the mounting kit. And the fan I already had. I could buy the fan standalone, but no. And also, the usually with the original fan, you would get one of these fan headers for your motherboard. But the power would actually come off on a Mulex. Because one of these fans pulls, this one pulls 870 milliamps. Uh, your headers are usually rated around 350, so you can technically burn them out. Uh, so they would have a splitter coming off, so you took a power direct from the power supply and you just sent the RPM signal to motherboard. Uh, this fan didn't have a cable harness, so I put one on with some uh, uh, resistors in parallel. The reason for that is just heat dissipation on the resistors part. But I pulled it down to about 190 milliamps on my power supply at 12 volts, so now the fan runs in practice around 7 or 8, and there's a good reason for that, because uh, this particular fan back in the day almost got me banned from a LAN. It runs at 5000 RPM full tilt, and you will hear it everywhere, in the next room and the new room next to that, so... Yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, limited by a few resistors. It helps you can get one cable, you know, not pulling too much from the motherboard, and people won't try to kill you at LAN. So that's a good thing. 
so this is our heat sink we're gonna use very nice heat sink i've been looking for a while so this and the for car are like the start of the show i think for this build uh, and we're quickly gonna cover this this is just an audio 2 uh, so nothing special but uh, yeah it's gonna go nice i have I have an adapter for the front in that case so gonna look at the case once we build it but i have an adapter so you can get the front audio out it's obviously a special connector because it's creative and there's no com port uh, i said com port but no uh, game port so firewire port i have no use for so having that on the motherboard is actually quite nice you can usually break that out with a cable but having it on the back of the motherboard was quite nice for this build so if anyone is like into uh, space simulators whatever on the LAN and that's perfect it can you can plug in a joystick there uh, so yeah this is the sound card we'll get some uh, 3d accelerated sound effects and stuff on this one with the EAX I think it's called the first thing we want to do before we actually start building the system in the case is to put on the mounting kit for the heatsink and put the heatsink on so we have these standoffs and like it's similar to like a modern motherboard and I put a piece of paper washer in between because the, these washers that I got with it is supposed to be a set of I think three different washers two for the spring two for the spacer in between here but these are probably for some other placement than over here because they're too thick if you put them on here I put them on and put something over because you want to make sure it's not too tall so, because then you're not going to reach the die and you're going to burn the ship and you don't want them to be super low so you might over tighten um, and bend the board so my solution because these were definitely too tall like at least like a millimeter so I just made some paper washers that will protect the board though it's not strictly needed because these are plated holes here and uh, yeah but uh, some protection is always nice so on the back here, I'm gonna actually made a piece of paper here. I'm just gonna cut it down a bit. It's um, I could use the washers, but uh, I don't think they're supposed to be there from a screenshot I've seen of the mounting kit. Uh, and because I made my own, they are slightly taller than the nuts that were supposed to go there. So a washer plus a nut might actually make them so tall that will hit the motherboard tray before I can screw the motherboard motherboard down. So. This will protect the board on the back. So I will tighten this down with some tools off camera, just uh, because it's easier. So I cleaned up the ship and the heatsink, so I put on some thermal paste here. So this is pretty tight, but uh, yeah. A lot of motherboards, the caps are just in the way, so you can't get this particular cooler on.
So that is the heatsink mounted. So next thing is just to mount the fan. Gonna check uh, to make sure everything is actually sitting as it should. So let's uh, mount the fan. Got some big stators here at the back. They help increase pressure usually. And direct airflow. So that's the Swiftec MC462 heatsink and fan mounted on the motherboard. And uh, this heatsink plus fan and the mounting kit is 777 grams. I have weighed it. It's quite massive for the time. So yeah, but I think it looks quite good and it's definitely overkill. But yeah, I like overkill. So this is the case we're gonna use. It's a, a new old stock case I picked up. It uh, even have a, has a stamp at the bottom uh, manufactured in 2003. I think they came out even a bit earlier than that. So they kind of period correct for what we need. So it, it already has a optical unit and a flop installed because I used it before. So we can reuse that. So the case is on the workbench here. So we're gonna start with installing the motherboard obviously. And that's uh, for USB on the front panel. So the audio too will go down here. Hopefully it fits. This one should actually have cable hooked up to it. And have HD1 because we have the hard drive on this, so we get the front LED for that instead of the motherboard. Now we can insert the graphics card. front order here is uh, an adapter I bought on eBay. And it wasn't worth making one anyway because it costs like five euros I think. But I uh, bought a few of those so I can use the front audio with the, the Sound Blaster series, the live and audio too. So, so get that there. 
And then we need a short SATA cable here and bottom. Bottom one here is SATA 1. So we get the HD LED match with that. A short cable, clean and nice. So yeah, I don't think there's much else to connect because the rest was in the case already. So we can test it now. So we have the system assembled. So let's power it on. So we have the boot. You can go to BIOS if you want to. Or the seal card BIOS there too. So the motherboard is a K7VT4A plus with the latest official BIOS. We got the Atom XP2000 turbos, 1800 megahertz, the caches, and a gig of RAM. And your memory, that's about it because it's free memory. It sets for the same timings anyway, so it's fine. I got our CPU, and that's not the, the actual CPU used, I guess, by the motherboard. Uh, at the next bit, doesn't have any sensor. The port 39 centigrade, and it's pretty hot today, probably 30 C inside right now. I got our V core at 1.6, 2.3, 3.2, but we can't trust this 100%. 5 volt is at 5.0. The power supply is actually specified at 5.08. It's a uh, WM power supply from a Dell or an HP or something, I think. Not much else except the boot priority here. And you can see floppy, and then we've got zero on DVD. And then we can see BBS zero at our SATA card, so we can actually pick that from here, which, which I like with this motherboard. My Asus board with the same chips, it cannot do this, and it just flips out totally. So, yeah. You can just reset and build it into Windows. Here we are in Windows, so we can check out the CPU and RAM here and motherboard if we want to. So you can see our Atom XP, Turbo Bread, uh, 130 nanometers, 1.6 volts, 2000 R plus. You can see the clocks here and the caches. Here's the main board, obviously. So, like I said, KT400. And the RAM here, 1 gig of DDR. You can see the timings here. And yeah, and we can see here the RAM is supposed to, it's not supposed to, but it's rated for 200 megahertz, so effective 400. 512 megabyte sticks. We can just check here. Here is our SIL card, uh, silicon image, SIL 3114. And our 500GB Samsung hard drive. And that's the VR Rhine network card integrated. And we got the, should be here, creative audio processor, but it's an audio 2. So, yeah. Everything is here. Don't I have a whole bunch of game on the hard drive, but not that much installed. Uh, that's my next task to do to make it land ready for whoever's gonna use it. But I got Halo and Quake 4. Quake 4 a bit demanding, but it's just more so I could see how it performed compared to that on MP. Uh, 
but it works. I mean, if you set the settings to low quality, it works. So uh, there is a built-in benchmark in in uh, Halo. I have to see if you can do properties. You can make your own shortcut with ti uh, time demo here after. So we can run that. I already know the score, but yeah. Microsoft Games Halo. Halo benchmark. We can run that. It runs pretty well. And, uh, I think the Atlantic was a little bit faster, uh, but uh, the frame times are pretty good on the system, so it feels a lot smoother even if the game is quite demanding. So in Halo, when you do the benchmark, you do get a file with the time and the frame rate. We can check that out. It's called conveniently time demo somewhere there. So I have some previous benchmark runs I done to figure out the frame rate. Apparently, whatever I did there was slower, but I did find out 800 by 600 was faster. So this is the completed system. So the, with this case, I also get one of these as a duct here for the CPU. You might have noticed there's a hole in the side before. So there's a hole there. And you also get these things here. Uh, they're basically intended to support cards. So I suppose that's a good thing if you're going on a LAN, because it has happened that cards wants to pop out a bit and not work so you basically mount this thing here you can adjust the depth of this thing here so it's adjusted to fit the cooler works very well with salmon cooler that has the fan mounted in the PCI slot if you don't have or don't want a bracket this works quite well with those coolers so you basically check that these hook up to your card pop that in place so now the CPU can suck air in there and it's even an explanation here, it says uh, blah blah blah. So it basically says here the case, the case built in air guide and system fan to upgrade cooling efficiency supply TM Bent 38C environment for Intel Pentium processors 3.06 GHz. Yeah, basically, this is to help your very hot Pentium processor. Like a Prescott or something or Norcord. So, but it works just fine for anything else. So, so that is the completed system. So, thank you for watching and have a nice day. If you want to follow us, you can go to our social media webpage, braindrainlan.tk, and pick your favorite platform. Link is in the description. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public LANs when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.